Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience and holding. We now have your presenters in conference. Please be aware that each of your lines is in a listen-only mode. You may submit your questions or comments electronically at any time during today's meeting by using the chat window located at the bottom right of the slideshow presentation. You may also download a PDF copy of today's presentation underneath the files window under the slideshow. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's first presenter, Mr. Chris Hund. Thank you so much, David. Hi, everybody. This is Chris Hund, uh, Senior Director with the American Hospital Association Center for Health Innovation. Thanks so much joining, for joining today for Building Strength in Teams Using Team Steps. Uh, we are sponsored today by Quality Reviews, and so you'll be hearing uh, in a few minutes from Dr. Edward Shin to talk a bit about that, so thanks to them. Uh, Glad all of you are joining. I see many of you are joining from cold and snowy places. Same here. I think it's zero degrees outside here, outside of Chicago, and we have more than a foot of snow on the ground with more to come. So, yay, winter. Uh, so, just some rules of engagement for today. You can listen to the audio two different ways. You could do it through the phone. If you use your phone, please mute your computer speakers, or you could do it through your computer. Uh, that's fine, too, although sometimes people have unstable Internet connections, and if that's the case, uh, go ahead and do it through your phone. So all hyperlinks on the screen are active. If you click on them, they'll just open up another window, so that might be very helpful to you as we go. And last but not least, the Q&A session is at the end of the presentation. So the way we like to do this is if you write questions in the chat, as they come to mind as we go on. If it's something logistical, we'll answer it right away. If it's something content-related, we'll pull it out and we'll turn it into a nice little discussion uh, between myself and our speaker at the end. To get continuing education credits from our partners uh, at uh, Duke University, you need to create a Duke OneLink account. You only need to do this once, so you might have done this before. Uh, but if you haven't, you have to uh, register and activate your account using your mobile number. So all of the information is available uh, here on the screen, but also in the file pod that you see on your screen, uh, the file says Instructions for Webinar CE Credit. So if you click on that, you can get the whole uh, bit of instructions right there. So. That is uh, something we'll throw on the screen again at the end so that you can see that number. Upcoming events from AHA team training. We have uh, some webinars coming up. Uh, one on February 25th about antimicrobial stewardship and HAI infection prevention. And then also uh, one on March 10th on uh, engaging physician partners to sustain safety culture. Please also join our online community platform, Mighty Network. It's free to join. We have hundreds upon hundreds of people in there, and they share stories. They share content. We share content from AHA Team Training. So it's just a great place to get together and talk about the things we've learned, lessons we've had, challenges we've had, and successes. So please go ahead and do that. It's a great, great location for all of that. That's also where you'll see the first announcement for new activities, courses, etc. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our sponsor today, which is Dr. Edward Shin, and he is from Quality Reviews. So, Dr. Shin, take it away. Thanks very much, Chris, and thank you all for the opportunity to speak uh, here before Dr. Henninger's webinar. Um, my name is Edward Shin, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Quality Reviews. And in a nutshell, we help health systems improve the experience for both patients and staff through the use of real-time feedback. Very briefly, because I know we have limited time, um, the way it works is we'll have an integration in with a health system's EMR or scheduling or HR uh, management solution. And once that integration is established, we'll use that data to text patients and or staff a link to a brief survey that the patient 
can take in real time after a visit or the staff member can take um, as well. And then all of that information is then displayed in real time on a web-based dashboard for the users at the health system, administrators and clinicians, nurse leaders, uh, patient experience officers, to log in and see that feedback coming in in real time, really making the data actionable um, and facilitating service recovery, which can lead to actionable uh, improvements in operations and, and overall experience. Just a notable clients, uh, we have been around for eight years and we're based in New York City, although I personally have uh, been working from Northern California over the last year or so. Um, and as you can see, we have some major um, medical centers, certainly in the New York City area where we're located, but also throughout the country, um, some great partners, um, for example, in Grady down south at Vanderbilt. Um, so we have a good national footprint. Um, and I'd like to show, show this slide to really demonstrate the uh, depth of experience that we've had in uh, improving patient experience for our partners that you see here. So I wanted to turn it back over to Chris, uh, but thank you for listening. This is my information. So if you do download the slides, you can got, get in touch with me. And please feel free to get in touch with me if you'd like to learn more about quality reviews. Uh, and without further ado, please enjoy Dr. Henninger's webcast. I'll turn it back over to you, Chris. Thank you so much, Dr. Shin. Uh, thank you for the information. It looks great. Uh, everybody, please uh, check out the Quality Reviews website. Uh, get in touch with them if you're interested. So today, we will be hearing from the Patient Experience Director at Duke Private Diagnostic Clinics, Sana Henniger. And Sana has presented for us before a wonderful presentation last year. This is really uh, part two of that presentation, although you did not need to watch the first one to see this one. But I highly uh, recommend checking it out. She's a great presenter with a lot of interesting ideas. So I look forward to hearing from her today and having a conversation at the end of the webinar. So Santa, take it away. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to scroll ahead here. So thank you so much. Again, my name is Santa, rhymes with Banana Henninger, um, Director of Patient Experience for Duke Private Diagnostic Clinics, where I very proudly work. I um, want to thank the American Hospital Association so much for having me, and thank you all for attending. really look forward to today. I uh, also just wanted to thank my boss, Kim Denty. She is just an amazing leader who has supported me in all of this work that I have done uh, with Team Steps. And so uh, looking at a patient experience model, you will see that building quality and safety culture is a huge part of my role and my belief in patient outcomes. Certainly, we know from research the risks of highly stressed healthcare work, workers and teams on safety and all patient outcomes. We also have research that helps us to understand what aspects of safety culture put us at greatest risk and where to focus our own efforts. So I collapsed a lot of barriers of, into to successful teamwork into a couple of broad themes for us to focus on today. And I'm going to do that through a case study, which will make it much more interesting and much more real. Uh, often we measure or consult about poor teamwork and coordination, employee interpersonal conflict, manifestations of stress, and certainly your particular interest when I looked at the questions you submitted were around engaging leaders and providers in learning and uh, engagement in psychological safety. So I will try to address everything today, and otherwise, you're always welcome to, to contact me. So for the agenda today, my goal really was to follow up on the high-level overview that I had provided in September with a more hands-on case study approach to see just a number of key best practices applied to a real case, case study. And if you attended or heard that other program in September, uh, wonderful. And if you have not, I hope that you will. Again, that program was a very high-level program uh, that gave a ton, an abundance of ideas. And again, I just wanted to narrow it down a little bit today. It was partly by request, too, to um, offer you some smaller, smaller chunks. And I also did some recordings uh, for my entity. And these are not so professionally recorded, but they might help give you some reminders or some tips as well. So starting with our fictitious 
story. Uh, what you will probably find as you listen is that many of you are probably going to think that I'm speaking directly to you or that maybe I worked with you, uh, and that is my goal. I was really trying to pick some scenarios and situations that probably all of you uh, on this call today or this session today um, have experienced at some point. And so I wanted to make it as applicable as possible. So we are going to start with Mary. She is the clinic manager, and we're going to start with her perspective and move this uh, story that she tells and that all the leaders tell into a really organized approach. And that is one of my key points uh, for, uh, for this organization of this, this um, case study today. So we'll start with Mary. She runs a very busy clinical area. Uh, she's under a tremendous amount of stress, as are her staff. She was asked to take on an additional clinic. She then lost her nurse manager, and a new medical director was coming on board. There have been low staffing, changed staff models, uh, new employees, and a merged clinic. So uh, the staff have also complained a little bit that there was get, they were getting different answers from the different leaders depending on who they asked, and that's because of the new, a new leadership team. So a uh, lot going on for Mary, a lot for her to think about and organize with this new, new team and new responsibilities. So in listening to her story, uh, I narrowed it down to two main areas, and she and I agreed upon this, that uh, there was a high degree of stress related to changes in staffing for the staff and the leaders, and then there was a new leadership team, new to the organization and new to their roles. Then we've got Joshua. So Joshua is the new nurse manager, and we want to get his perspective and full story. What he's noticed is that the clinical staff were a little bit divided between new staff and staff that had been there during this merger, and there was negativity, blame, and gossip about one another. Two nurses had had conflict in the hallway uh, related to poor communication and role clarity, and then the clinical staff were complaining that some of the providers were a little bit abrupt and inconsistent, and then he just hasn't had the time, or the leadership team just did not have the time to get together and really talk about some of these issues. So narrowing that down for Joshua, the nurse manager, where he really wanted to, to focus with his clinical staff was on clinic conflict and then clinical staff coordination. So Elena, she is our new medical director. She is also new to the role of being a medical director and so was learning a little bit about the scope of her role and her responsibilities. As she rounded on her providers, she found that they were a little frustrated with the clinical staff for not rooming their patients uh, early enough in the morning and that they weren't always following their preferences um, and learned later that the, the preferences were not always consistent. We'll talk about that. The providers were very stressed and really just needed the clinical staff to do exactly uh, what they asked. And then Elena had also become aware of some of the clinical staff conflicts and had actually tried to get involved. So we needed to talk a little bit about role clarity as well. So Elena's uh, perspective, narrowing that down, was provider stress. And then secondly was the coordination between the providers and clinical staff. So after she talked to Joshua, she realized, wow, we, we probably need to pull these two uh, professions together and really understand where that disconnect was happening. So having spoken to all three of them and pulling their stories together, we were able to create one focus list. And here we've got our five different areas of focus based on the needs of each of those three leaders. The next thing that needed to happen was given that focus list, we really wanted to deepen the understanding and to gain insight and perspective on each of those by asking all of the right questions. So do team members, know how to manage conflict? Are there issues between uh, staff because the roles are not clear? Do we as a leadership team show a united front? Are the team members clear on their roles, uh, not just as their jobs, but between professions with one another? So those are the questions that you may ask of your focus list to get that deeper understanding. Then you want to get organized and actually list, create your focus list, create an action plan, list those leadership perspectives and, and causes and impact from those discussions with leadership. Those discussions with leadership may extend to rounding with the employees to, again, 
get that really deeper understanding for the, the five areas of, of focus. So for conflict, for instance, we knew that stress was contributing to poor behaviors uh, amongst one another. We knew that interpersonal skills were lacking and with a new staff and some very um, brand new to their to, to having a job at all, interpersonal skills in healthcare uh, can, can use education. And so education was a part of the plan. And then there wasn't really a conflict management protocol that was really understood by the whole team because the leadership team had not really clarified one with one another. So that needed to be clarified as well. And again, we'll get into all of those interventions to answer some of these uh, issues. So then, of course, next is establishing goals for each of those areas. For instance, communication in the newly formed team, we wanted streamlined communication and uh, relevant tools for the right meeting. So they had not really established briefs or debriefs or huddles and had not uh, even explored the, the very creative uses of SBAR, for instance. So that was then a goal that this team had put together. So the next, um, the next section is actually now putting together your action plan, your interventions, your activities. And I'm going to have us expand this column into uh, it, a page of its own. So here are the uh, activities and interventions that I've chosen in red and who was assigned to them. So this is a, an action plan that a leadership team could, could put together. Prior to actually starting any of those action plans, we really need to make sure that that leadership team is aligned. I recommend a leadership alignment activity for newly formed uh, leadership teams, uh, for teams that have been together for a long time, or for leadership teams that are struggling in some way. It's an activity that I use uh, for all levels of teams, and I think it's one that needs to be reviewed uh, pretty regularly. So the, the activity actually is a set of questions. And again, this is not actually a team steps activity, but it's one that I just always use to help build a unified uh, leadership team. But it's a, basically a set of questions that point to areas of importance for that leadership team. And these sample questions are really good, but you may have a set of questions that are most important to, to you. So for instance, this uh, one of the, some of the most, two of the most important questions are, are our roles clear to each other and to our staff? But believe it or not, despite the fact that a medical director, a nurse manager, and a healthcare administrator or clinic manager have roles and responsibilities listed, there's often overlap, there's often some confusion. It's not always so clear as to be able to write it on a job description. So uh, often as it comes to conflict or managing performance issues, there can be uh, some gray areas, and we want to make sure those are discussed and, and clear. Uh, what patterns or issues do we have or observe that we could plan better for? So if there becomes a pattern of interactions or struggles with efficiency or something operational, how do we capture those patterns as a leadership team and actually address them together? So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have us not do the chat box because um, I'm not sure I could be able to read them. Um, so the three areas that this leadership team started, and actually, if you guys would like to have a conversation with yourselves about um, your predictions about some of these activities, that would be wonderful. But I'm going to move forward. Uh, so the leadership alignment activity for this leadership team, where they wanted to focus, was how do we prefer to communicate and meet with each other in the clinic? Believe it or not, this is often an issue that I see with leadership teams, is how and when are we going to communicate? Sometimes medical directors, they just only want it by email, or a clinic manager only wants it by, by phone, or there is just no time to do it on a daily basis. There's just no time to do a longer meeting. So they have to find something, though. Uh, often I will have leadership teams tell me, well, we talk to each other all day or every day, but it's not as organized as is needed. So in order to be able to answer some of those questions on a regular basis to make sure things are aligned, we really have to establish a, some sort of meeting format. And as we know, in healthcare, this is very difficult. Uh, I recommend it to this group that they at least meet one time for 30 minutes to a full hour and really cover each of those questions 
as well as other areas of interest uh, to, that, to that team. So that is what they actually agreed on, and they came up with a, a standard agenda. Another question that they wanted to explore further was, do we appear as a united front, and are we consistent with our responses? So one of the complaints of the staff was that responses were not really that consistent, or they may ask the leader and get an answer, and then later find out that that actually was not going to be the case. And so this leadership team really wanted to come across as a united front to be organized in their responses, and so just simply made the decision that we are going to be a united front, and we will not respond to staff questions that involve the whole clinic without consulting with one another first. And that actually solved several problems that had um, had arose from from this this um, area. So, what is our united approach for dealing with clinic conflict? This one is uh, so important: is the understanding by all staff and the leaders of how clinic conflict is actually managed. And we will get into the details of that, but they came up with an agreement with, amongst each other as clinical staff, but then also came up with an agreement as a leadership team for how we will approach it, how we will respond, what we will say, uh, whether or not, uh, how we will respond if an employee comes to one of us versus the other, and so they mapped all of that out and then actually shared that with, with the staff. So we are going to speak of Mary. So she is the one, the clinic manager, who is dealing with the multiple amounts of change and stress, and she uses three different tools to uh, help, her, help her staff. So as a constantly changing team, there was really little empathy or understanding amongst the professions who didn't really know each other. So even within the clinical staff, even within the provider group um, and the office staff group, they were not understanding of, e of each other's roles. And when we don't understand each other's roles or stressors, then we tend to uh, expect things that maybe we, we shouldn't be expecting or get frustrated where maybe we should have some, some understanding. So this activity is really more about how do we get professionals to understand each other's roles and lives a little bit better. And it can be done in a variety of ways. I've actually had uh, some, some staff will actually spend an hour uh, in the lives of another profession. That can be very difficult to do uh, with busy clinics, of course. So there are other ways to do it. You can have uh, employees from one profession actually sort of interview and round on the staff from other professions and then learn that way and ask some really pertinent questions. So kind of what's the most difficult stressor for you during the day? Well, part of your job might surprise other professions. And then you could have those employees sort of report out what their learnings were of the other profession. So for this case study, uh, Mary, uh, she had everybody report out in the staff meeting what their learnings were. And the office staff actually realized why the clinical staff didn't always answer the phone. And because office staff would complain, well, how can we help our patients if, if clinical staff are not answering the phone? And why don't they answer their phone? So in going to the back with those clinical staff, suddenly they understood the clinical staff members' lives and why they may not actually be able to answer the phone. And from that, the clinical staff and the office staff actually came up with some, some great ideas for solving that problem, one of which was they would have a point person uh, that would actually be connected with the office staff point person uh, per day. Clinical staff also learned about the provider collective and personal stressors that really helped them to not feel as uncomfortable when the day didn't go well and that they could see it kind of on the provider's faces. And providers really began to understand the stress that they caused the clinical staff when they seemed uh, frustrated or unhappy. So those learnings really helped this group to have some more empathy towards each, each other, to come up with some efficiency ideas, and just ultimately to, to work better with each other. So this is my favorite tool probably I've ever used. I've used it so many different times, and I did talk about this in September, but wanted you to see how this can actually play out. So in order to bridge communication gaps during change and with new employees, this particular intervention was, was really critical. And it's probably 
one of the best uh, in this presentation. And, and later on, we will actually see how you could use this same tool with one provider and one staff member. The tool basically is three questions. And if you were to have your all of the staff together, which is my favorite, having office staff in one side of the room, clinical staff in one side of the room, and then pr providers in one, one side of the room, and each of them has to ask, answer three questions. Uh, and the three questions are, what do we predict the other profession needs from us, and how could we contribute better? Uh, that encourages ownership and self-reflection. What do we need from them? So now we get our opportunity to express our own needs, and then what do we appreciate in them? And this leads to a meeting that ends very positively because the appreciations make people smile and feel better about everything discussed, but you will leave with three to five really actionable items per profession. And, uh, but again, done in a really positive way. It also just sort of starts the avenues of communication between professions around issues that perhaps have been sitting in people's minds for, for a long time. So as it relates to psychological safety, this is a really safe way to get your teams and your professions to communicate with one another. So looking at a real case study, this is actual real. Uh, this is the findings that I uh, had a, a, a sort of a timekeeper or a minute taker uh, keep from a meeting that we had with clinical staff. So a clinical staff member actually took these notes and sent these out to the staff as their final understanding of what they learned from this meeting. So the clinical staff said, providers, please be clear and timely and open to questions. We really want to support you. So their complaint was, we would love to support them, but uh, they're so busy and so unclear at times that we, we have a hard time supporting them. So please brief with us in the mornings just for a few minutes so that we can capture your needs and ask questions about things that may have not been consistent this week. Uh, some, some appreciations really help us a lot. Please use the flags on the doors. Be direct with your needs. And what they decided they could do better uh, on behalf of the front desk, they really thought they could do a better job in communicating about delays. And again, they establish that point person uh, and coordinator mornings to help room our providers' uh, patients a little bit more quickly. So a lot came out of it. This is just looking at what the clinical staff provided because, again, I wanted you to see uh, a real, real set of results from that activity. So Mary also had to think about just the impact of constant change as uh, all of us in healthcare and, and really the world have experienced in the past year. Always remember from a psychological standpoint that the brain is asking three questions when change happens is why should I, right? That's where resistance come in, comes in. I need some buy-in and sometimes we can't even get buy-in because it's just something that's not good or we didn't have control over. Can I do this is related to the anxiety. So we have to give lots of information, lots of education, honesty, case studies of, of how uh, other groups have worked problems out and, and survived and done well. And then the focus for the next activity is really on degree of control. That is what the human brain is looking for when it's anxious or goes through change is some kind of plan or degree of control. Otherwise, we don't get through those stages of grief very well and we might kind of sit in the anger or the bar bargaining or depression stage uh, and not, not ever get to that acceptance of, of here we are. So gaining that sense of control, this is, uh, you, you probably have seen this before either from me or, or elsewhere. It's a way of simply organizing what can we control and what can we not control. And sometimes seeing this visually and using it as an actual team activity will allow your employees to visually see, here are things that we really could do something about, and let's figure out how we can do them. For many of you, this would be performance improvement projects, or A3s, or your, your quality improvement uh, systems that you may have in place. What you can't control, people really need to understand and sort of visually see, here's what I just can't control, but there are still some things that I can do about that. For instance, uh, no time to solve problems. If there's no time to solve problems, then we have to figure out how do we make it so that in healthcare we can solve problems in the increments of time that we have. Because when I hear 
we have no time to solve problems. It's because in healthcare, we really don't have a lot of time to solve problems. And if we do, it's, it's going to be in small increments. So helping a team to really figure out how can we think about our problems in the small increments of time that we may have. So maybe for five minutes, you and I can sit here and do a little bit of brainstorming, and maybe we'll get five minutes tomorrow, and um, maybe all of us can get five minutes and join together as a huddle with our ideas. So being creative in how do we how do we manage the things that we just can't control, but come up with ways to make it the best that we can possibly make it. Uh, this is just good for the brain, for stress management, and certainly for, for teams as well. So building your action plan uh, for Joshua. So he is managing his new clinical staff team. Again, they're new to each other. Uh, there's been conflict and some um, gossip and, and, and blaming. And so we need to give them some structure and a psychologically safe place to discuss what's leading to some of those behaviors. So team values, this is a, another a, a favorite activity. And if you think about it, this activity is really done and has been done throughout your life. So when you went to kindergarten, there were all kinds of team values that were laid out for how we're going to work together and how we're going to behave together. So in most of your relationships, uh, based on uh, the culture or the norms of an area, there are going to be values that are in, in place. Sometimes if it's a new group or a group that is struggling, it can be a really good idea to establish those norms through discussion. So whether or not I have a new group or one that is struggling, I usually uh, get to what, what are the team values. So that can be done in discussion. Most companies have values that are uh, important to the company and laid out. These, these team values are going to relate directly to certainly a corporate or a company or a healthcare set of values. So this is more of a subculture of us as a team, how do we want to manage what we go through every day, what our service line manages every day, how we interact with one another every day. And it can be done uh, through discussion. Typically what I do is I will ask a team what is important to you as opposed to um, you know, why are you guys blaming each other or having so much conflict? I will ask a, a broader psychologically safe question of what's important to, to this team. That's a really safe question, and typically employees will say, well, I think it's really important that we don't talk about each other. I think it's really important that we approach each other directly. And so the answers to that question become the starting place for the team values for a group. And this particular group chose the first three. So they said, we are going to watch our stress levels and be really careful how we respond to one another. We're going to manage disagreements early and with care so that relationships stay strong. And we're going to look for ways to help each other. So those three were the top ones that they wanted to focus on, this, particularly the clinical staff group. And many different ways that they used uh, to sustain that they would, uh, Joshua would actually interview and in his rounding or interviews with clinical staff on a monthly basis, he would actually go through those team values and ask them more personally, uh, how, how's it going with this team value? Do you, do you feel like you're contributing to it? Do you feel like the team is actually adhering to what they promised one another? Uh, you could post it in break rooms. You could have it on the back of your agenda. You could use it in actual coaching discussions. I hope that we don't have to, to get there, but sometimes uh, we could use that actually in coaching discussion. So many different ways that it could be used. What they did was they posted in their break room. And uh, then what they added to that was uh, some little sticky notes of compliments for who had done a really good job with one of them or just a thank you to each other. So that was just a, a fabulous outcome of, of the, that activity. Helpfulness and task assistance. This is one that I think I have probably done with every group I've ever worked with is the, it's really the team value and the norms around how are we going to help each other. And this one's so important because what I have found as I have worked with clinical staff groups and interviewed all of them, so I had a time once where there were 15 clinical staff members and I interviewed all of them and 
uh, a little more than half of them actually thought that, well, I shouldn't have to ask for help because if we're situationally aware, uh, then we should notice each other when we need help and, and somebody will jump in and notice that I need help and I won't have to ask. Others said, well, no, I shouldn't really have to offer to, ask, to offer help because if we need help, we should be asking directly. And of course, some of both is, is true, uh, but we, we are needing to be responsible for knowing when we need help and asking for it. And then sort of second to that, of course, if we see somebody who needs help, we will offer it. But this actually needed to be discussed openly because the different perspectives were in the room and uh, feeling and thinking of something different. And so we have to actually bring that out in discussion of how do we actually be helpful? How do we bring helpfulness to life in an organized way? And what they came up with was really brilliant. And this is real also. This is a team that came up with this. Uh, so if you need help, it really is our responsibility to ask. And it was wonderful to see some clinical staff kind of raise their hand and say, um, it's just hard to ask for help because, you know, you know, we're clinical staff and we're supposed to, um, you know, save the world. And so we talked a little bit about that. Another one was if you see someone in need of help, offer assistance, but only offer what you have. So some clinical staff would say, hey, I would love to offer help, but I never want to because I only typically have three or five minutes and I'm afraid of getting caught up in something and losing my flow with my own provider. So we decided if you have five minutes, offer five minutes. Don't offer more than what you can. And if you can't help, then say, say it gracefully, right? Say no gracefully, maybe kind of include a little yes in there. Yes, I can help now, but um, I can't help now, but maybe I could in a few minutes. So those were the true... Uh, team values from uh, a team that I, I worked with and want to do again to see something something real. So Joshua was very happy about that outcome and those decisions. He was able to use those right along with the team values and kind of included those in there. So the other area he wanted to work on with Elaine as the medical director was the coordination with the providers. And so they decided to start establishing debriefs and made them very short, though, because the fear I always find with debriefs or briefs or ex extra meetings is everybody kind of puts their hands up and says, you know, look, I, I don't even have time to use the restroom half the time. I cannot handle having a daily meeting now at the end of the day. Besides, we're all staggered and we're not always here at the same time. So what I say to that is uh, promise to keep it short. And I would actually have a, a timer so that it is only – five minutes, particularly if it's a brief in the morning, but even for debriefs, keeping them short, keeping them timed, and keeping them very organized with a set agenda that everybody is prepared. So uh, a particular example is using the what went well that I appreciate, what did you need from me, and what could I have done better? Very, very easy debrief. That could be used between a provider and a clinical staff or between a, a, a clinic who wants to share where they thought uh, change could have happened for that particular day. So in the case studies, the themes that they came out um, from debriefs was providers not giving instructions to patients. So the clinical staff didn't really realize that the providers were relying on them completely to give instructions afterwards. And when they learned that, uh, some of the providers said, look, I, I do need to do a better job at that. And then for others, the clinical staff said, well, I'm going to really take this on. I want this to be on the after-visit summary, and I want to actually use a highlighter and, and make sure things are clear. So that was a wonderful uh, discovery. Inconsistent use of the whiteboard. Some of them were using them, some of them not. And then everybody needed to attend huddle, even if they read it afterwards. But that was a problem, too, because some were attending, some were not. So then some people knew what was happening through the day, and some, some did not. So Joshua also needed to really think about conflict and how he was going to get a handle on the behaviors towards one another when there was conflict and how he was going to help them to be better, uh, better at that. So psychological safety, again, that's a word that I've used a, a couple of times. It's, it's a little bit of a nebulous term, but it really comes down to are we comfortable asking questions? Are we comfortable uh, not knowing the not knowing the answer, and if we're not comfortable, then we are not psychologically safe, and we are more at risk 
of making mistakes, of not pointing out errors. And so as a starting place, he really wanted to understand psychologically psychological safety and how do, how do we establish that and what does it actually mean. So the establishing of team values was the starting place because if you can get team values in line that are lined up with what psychological safety means, that is, again, your key starting place and your prevention of conflict. Education, very, very important for uh, how teams tend to struggle, where some of the barriers to teamwork are, and then also, how do we um, use the norms in our, our daily verbiage through, throughout um, stress, stressful days and change? A question that was asked of me on several, from several of you uh, before, prior to this presentation even starting, um, that you had submitted was, what if leaders or providers do not display psychological safety or they're not engaged? That's a very, that's a whole other course and I would love to answer this in more depth with any of you who ask. A couple of thoughts about that is for, for someone, perhaps a leader beneath that leader, having a crucial conversation with that leader about uh, coming from a supportive angle where uh, the idea is I really want to support you in your approach to the staff and I want to join with you as co-leaders uh, to make an environment that is comfortable for everyone. I also encourage people to stay focused on safety culture, e even without uh, a leader who may establish psychological safety. And that is, that is very difficult. Um, I'm not suggesting that's ideal for sure, but you don't lose focus on what can, what can be done, what you can control despite a piece that maybe you can't control. So continue to build that psychological safety uh, with, your, with your smaller groups. Sometimes I have pulled smaller groups or professions together and said, this is really, really difficult. Where your psychological safety is going to happen is with each other. And so helping people to form those subcultures that are psychological safe, psychologically safe. But another uh, idea is to, is to help a leader or provider be a part of a psychologically, psychological safety effort by giving them a, a sort of a task or an idea that shows psychological safety. So if you can encourage a leader or a provider to send a kind thank you email or to say a few words in huddle, uh, then you're really setting them up for success by asking them to do the small tasks that perhaps they don't do on their own or don't do naturally. So that's another way to think about it. How do we engage them is by giving them these small incremental tasks that they could likely do and, and may very well be willing to do. Um, and it just sort of came from, came from you. And, and that, that can be certainly okay. So the other part that we put together was for the helpfulness that I mentioned earlier, was as, a, as it relates to psychological safety, it was so important for the language to be chosen as well. So they actually came up with language for how they were going to help each other and how they were going to approach each other in general. So that was a part of, again, the psychological safety and creating a psychologically safe environment. Again, by creating verbiage that then further detailed one of the values that that team felt was so, was so important. The team value for conflict management, this I mentioned early uh, in this presentation today as being critically important, particularly for a new leadership team. So um, the leadership team, Joshua, Mary, and Elena, had to really get together and figure out how are we as a leadership team going to manage conflict. So if somebody comes to one of us, what do we do next? And the, ultimately, they were decided that they would manage it together and they would say, well, let me check with our leadership team and we will, we will help you through this conflict. But the real agreement comes from each leader typically with their own staff that they support. And that agreement is you are welcome to come to me as your leader. What I will probably suggest is I will coach you to manage that situation uh, on, on your own. But if that doesn't work, you come back. 
And if you come back, then I will likely get the other person involved. That kind of agreement, and I encourage you to read this slide later, uh, is one that is so important to be shared with the staff. Because otherwise, you will have some staff who will walk in your office with complaints about somebody else, and they will talk to you about it for a year. But they won't want anything done about it. It also le lets the other person out with no voice in the conflict. So it's very important to have these agreements so that you don't have your staff, perhaps your really good staff, who say, I'm not going to go to my leader about this conflict. That's going to make me look really negative. So now you have a very inconsistent way that your staff are approaching you on conflict, and you don't want that either. So really important to come up with an agreement amongst yourselves as leadership teams that you then share with your, your staff. What the leadership team also did, and Joshua set this up, was some education on emotional intelligence. And so that's a model that I really, I really like. Obviously, I did not create that model. Uh, but I really like that model. And so he brought in a speaker to talk about emotional intelligence and how you actually can use emotional intelligence for conflict management. So going back to that original action plan, we did add in some education pieces as well that, that they could then follow up and use. This is a conflict worksheet using uh, emotional intelligence. So it had a set couple of questions that focused on myself. Am I aware uh, of my behaviors? How well do I manage it? Do I focus on other people with relationship awareness? And then do I manage those relationships with the right kinds of words and behaviors? So this conflict worksheet was actually, Joshua actually um, asked his employees to fill this worksheet out anytime they had a conflict with another employee so that when he met with them, they could be organized and they could actually kind of go through the different aspects of emotional intelligence in their conversation and, and to allow him to be a better coach to those employees, but also was then able to use it to navigate conversations between, between two employees. So the two nurses that he had conflict with, he had both of them fill this out, discuss it with him individually, and then in those individual sessions, they would decide which parts were really important to bring when the three of them met. So that was really, really effective. And he was very careful to, uh, to um, grab hold of conflict that he saw on the floor as early as possible, which was also one of the values that the team had put together. And then we have Elena, our medical director. And her big focus was on provider stress. Uh, but, but mostly on the clinical staff and provider coordination. So she was also concerned about the provider uh, concerns about the clinical staff and also listening to where the clinical staff were concerned about the providers as she and Joshua had talked. So SBAR, a very simple tool. All of you know it. It's not difficult to remember or to use, but the creative use of SBAR uh, has just amazed me over the past couple of years. And so with these providers who were feeling as though the clinical staff were uh, not doing all that they needed and uh, the triage nurses were not taking all the kinds of information in their messages that they wanted, I said, why don't we all get together and create an SBAR template? For, to explain what is needed. So the providers were actually able to say, here's what I need in this situation, here's what I don't need, right? And then the triage, the, the clinical staff and triage nurses were able to say the same to the providers. Well, we get confused because some of you want this and some of you don't. So could, if we could get some clarity around that. So the discussion was wonderful, the template was wonderful, and the outcome was wonderful. So brief for clinical staff, this I often recommend for a provider and a clinical staff member who work together and tell me, well, we talk to each other all day long, and yet they're not communicating well. And then when I interview each of them individually, they're telling me all kinds of concerns and complaints about the other um, that obviously had not been ever discussed in conversation. So what I often do then is bring those, those two together for discussion to collect those patterns. But then I often recommend that they brief. And the brief, again, is a promise 
three to five minute a meeting where they have a very set agenda that both can come together and, and discuss. The case study, uh, and again, these are, these are real outcomes, just a different, you know, not necessarily real entire story here. Um, but the, the case study that I'm thinking of is they added a challenging patient to their daily agenda so that they could coordinate care and, agenda, and, and messaging. So they had a often difficult um, patient population and wanted to be really prepared with their language and words to the patient and consistent with, with one another. This is also a real life uh, debriefing example between a provider and a uh, clinical staff. So as opposed to briefs, what I just talked about, this is debrief. So after a debrief between a provider and clinical staff that I kept saying you guys really need <laughs> to talk and meet, um, the clinical staff member was such an organized, such an incredible uh, nurse, and she just said, if you want me to keep you organized, then when I keep you organized, I need you to do what, I, what you want me to, to, do, to do. And so the provider in his, he said, what I can do better is I can absolutely follow your lead since I am asking you to keep me organized. Um, so another idea that the clinical staff member came up with is, look, I will put the papers in a nice order in front of you, uh, but just you just need to go ahead and do them. So this was a wonderful debriefing exercise that we actually just did once and came up with some really great ideas and some actually really kind of humorous conversation that I think just um, saved and, and built their relationship. So in closing, here is the, we're back to the, that original action plan of the tools that we went through for Mary, Joshua, and Elena. And one of the last steps, of course, was then to come back together just as we would do in any problem solving and really evaluate kind of where are we, what happened, what worked well, and what, what do we need to do next. So very happy team in the end, um, doing better. As we know, teams continue to um, have their ups and downs and struggles, and there was a lot of follow-up that needed to be done through all of these activities, but with the aligned leadership team and the values and the norms and the agreements and the protocols and the meeting structures in place, all um, related to team sets tools, the team was much higher functioning. So um, somebody had also asked about research. I didn't focus as much on research this time, but um, American Hospital Association has an incredible website with all kinds of information related to evidence-based uh, tools and tips from certainly from team steps. So that brings me to a close. I thank you so much for being here today. Uh, this is a true passion of mine, and um, enjoy seeing all of your names or working with you. Um, and I hope you have a, a wonderful, a wonderful day. If there is time for questions, glad to do that. And otherwise, glad to hear from you anytime. Thank you so much, Santa. That was wonderful. Really appreciate it. You're getting great great glowing comments in the chat so you'll have to, to check that out um real uh real quick somebody did just ask before we get to the question to what extent they can use your examples your your case example here and your ideas uh are you open with that with them using your your case study i am i am happy i uh, actually Anybody who would use those case studies, they're, everybody's in healthcare's case, case studies. So I would be happy if I'm making any change in anyone's life out there. So absolutely. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, so like I said, lots of great, great comments coming in. Uh, one question from earlier on that was maybe a little bit more broad was, how have all of these different this team has been able to foster or you've been able to foster with your work been, uh, you know, altered or morphed at all by the pandemic? So I, I, it broke up a little bit. I think I, I – could you just summarize that one more time? I just want to make sure I heard it clearly. It broke up just a little bit. Sure. I'm sorry about that. So it's yeah. – uh, so the question is, is how has all of this morphed or changed due to the pandemic? For, for this particular team or um, kind of more, more broadly? Uh, you know, I, I would be curious about, I think, the team, but then also about your work in general, your broader okay. work in general. So what I will say is, so this was this sort of case study um, 
a lot of pieces of it were real, and the, the, the story exactly is, of course, altered and different and has many different pieces to it. I, this is what I will say. I will say that the success of any kind of action plan like this is really going to come from the leadership team staying aligned and sustaining the activities and the efforts. So sometimes what I see, um, of course, I don't see it now because I strongly discourage it, but sometimes you can find that we'll, we'll put a great action plan in place and then we may not stick with it as much as we want to. So the success is going to be based on that sustainment plan of how often are we going to look at our team values? Um, are we going to make sure that with our conflict management that we debrief on how that conflict management went. So over time, the activities you put in place, they've got to keep on going and continue to be evaluated. So that's how, what will define your success. Um, but I would say when, when the activities come together, that is also related to success. So if you were to do just one of these activities and, and that was it and ignore others, we all know how systems work. It's like a clock. One piece of it is not working. The whole clock is not going to work. And so as I work with any clinic or clinical area, I'm going to look at the whole system. And you have to treat the whole system. So that would be another factor to success. So as opposed to answering, does this help, I will say, yes, it absolutely helps as long as you have these factors in place. Sustainment and, and systems thinking, where you put all those pieces together at, at one time, in, in sync. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. How do you bring on? How do you bring on new leaders to the team, or I guess even onboard anybody? Because this is a different way of doing business. And perhaps if you're not involved from the start, it might seem. You know, it, 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 there's a learning curve. It's shocking maybe to join a leadership team that's looking at things differently. So have you had to do that where you've had to bring on somebody in the middle of the action? I, absolutely. I, I don't know that any leadership team probably comes together all at the same time. So typically you have a new leadership team anytime one of them one of them turns over. And what I will say to that is that it's not so much about team steps tools or it, it being anything different than what a good relationship would do. So whether or not you are thinking about it from a performance improvement standpoint, which we have, we have a um, do quality systems, which uh, helps us to do real time problem solving. We just pull those two together, and it doesn't matter what it's called. It it matters how effective are we and what do we need to evaluate to be more effective. So whether or not it's um, operations being involved or um, t team steps or performance issues, we pull all of that together as opposed to thinking about, gosh, this is a team steps team or this is a performance improvement team. We pull all of those efforts together um, and don't really have necessarily a name for it. So I wouldn't even say, gosh, this would be a weird culture to come into. It hopefully mm -hmm. is just a healthy culture that has been designed, no matter what you call it. So I name my tools this yeah. way, I name it something else. No, that makes sense. You know, there there were a few questions in here that said, you know, specifically, what tools would you use for, you know, fill in the blank? And I and I think what you're saying, you know, really makes a lot of sense. Is that you know, just when the culture is built. It doesn't, you know, you don't have to worry to, you know, specifically about a certain tool or doing certain things. It's, it's building that culture and making sure that people have ownership over how they're going to build the culture. So, Right. And you definitely want to choose your sort of tools and interventions very, very carefully. But, but yeah. the name of them or, you know, the, the yeah, the, the name of them or where they came from doesn't matter as much as it's well thought out. And whether you call it team values or ground rules or, you know, whatever the name is, uh, though, that doesn't matter. What matters is that it's well chosen. It's based on understanding the story and that deeper understanding of, of the story. Thank you so much. So uh, we are at the top of the hour. I want to make sure we, we thank again 
Quality Reviews and Dr. Edward Shin for, for sponsoring this wonderful webinar by Santa Henninger from Duke. So thank you so much. Uh, please fill out the evaluation, everybody, uh, for the continuing education credit. This on screen right now is the code you need to text within the next 24 hours to the phone number that's on screen. Uh, Again, before you leave, if you want to download instructions for how to do the CE, that's in that files pod, as well as the slide deck, that's in the files pod. It takes us a couple of days to turn around these recordings, but the recording will be available on the AHA team training website. So thank you all very much again for joining today. Please stay in touch with us. And uh, Santa, thank you again for everything. Thank you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's presentation. You may disconnect your phone lines, log off your webinars, and thank you for joining us this afternoon.